okay, it's recording. So today is my great pleasure to welcome Ivan Smaluch, who is professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, he's going to speak about his recent result on skirmions. So Ivan did his, P did his PhD at the University of Kent at Ohio under supervision of uh, Oleg Lavrentovich. After that, he make a postdoc at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then he joined the faculty as assistant professor at University of Boulder, where he is still working till now as a full professor. And last but not least, Ivan Smaluch was a, or is a consultant on our recently approved FCT proposal, and I would like to thank him for his support, which was a very important ingredient for this uh, approval of this proposal. And now I give a word to Ivan. Please, Ivan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mikola. It's uh, really a great pleasure uh, to share uh, with you a little bit about uh, our research on topological solitons and their uh, out equilibrium behavior. Um, it would have been really um, even more pleasure to visit Lisbon, but we are all unfortunately locked at our homes and uh, hometowns. Um, hopefully there will be better times. Um, and so I would like to start with this uh, uh, pictorial, or I should say video introduction to my um, presentation that we'll have today. Uh, so what you can see at the bottom are- Are you sharing one? Of... Are you sharing screen? Yes. Oh, uh, because I don't see I anything. Really... Oh, I see. I'm so sorry. I, I was um, under the impression that this was already shared, but apparently that's not the case. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. It now should make a lot more sense. So <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, so you can see in here in the bottom row, uh, video preview of my presentation. And the little object that you can see moving uh, in all different ways in here are topological solitons that we'll discuss. They're really not even particles, uh, just the structures in the field, in the field of pneumatic liquid crystal molecular orientations. Uh, and you can see in here that uh, they do behave like particles and not just like particles, but active particles may be reminding you behavior of animals, bacteria, right? Uh, forming all different types of schools and herds and moving collectively. In some cases, preserving what we should call now social distancing, like maybe here in this middle case, Right, but in the other case, um, uh, really behaving in a way as um, um, you know would be during non-pandemic times, right? They are very uh, in, a, in a very much uh, close proximity of each other, uh, and so all of these very different types of behavior arise um, for topological solitons when we power them by oscillating. Um, applied electric field, as I'll discuss today in my talk. And so before I start, however, I should acknowledge um, the work of my uh, students and postdocs who, who did it. Uh, so um, uh, in particular, Haley Song, she is here. She just graduated uh, in the spring this year. Uh, Paul Ackerman, uh, who used to be also a PhD student with us and now is a postdoc at Princeton, um, and Benny Tai, uh, he is here. So let's get started. Uh, and uh, I would like to start with a very brief introduction into topological solitons. So these are the structures in the field, like magnetization field, the spin orientations uh, in magnetic systems, as an example, right, where um, the structures uh, that we're interested in, that are topological solitons, are topologically distinct from the background. So you can see in here 
uh, a uniform background at the bottom and the topological soliton at the top, you cannot smoothly morph the structure at the top to get to the uniform state at the bottom, right? And this is why uh, they are topologically non-trivial. Uh, they are characterized by a topological invariant and they are different from the uniform structure that you can see at the bottom, um, uh, just like topological singular defects would be different from uh, the uniform structures. In a way, it's also similar to uh, how the sphere and donut would have different topological characteristics like genus and Euler characteristic. At the same time, we can morph these structures by applying electric field. And so you could imagine, you know, morphing uh, a torus to a coffee mug, right? Like in this video in here, but in a similar way, just by applying electric field, we can morph such a structure from axisymmetric embodiment that you can see in the middle to the one which is highly asymmetric on the right. And uh, with that, the topological invariant, the skirmion number that characterizes such uh, topological soliton is not changing, but the structure changes considerably, right? So we are pretty much without changing this invariant uh, are able to morph by just applying electric fields. And so, such topological solitons attract a lot of interest in different branches of condensed matter physics. And then here you can see them being found in magnets, liquid crystals, ferroelectrics, uh, in electromagnetic fields, in light, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, in magnetic systems, they are very much of interest for uh, spintronic memory applications, right? So in particular, one type of um, information storage that people might use in the near future would involve these topological solitons, which in here you can see moving on a racetrack, being recorded, uh, written in and read out uh, in different locations, and then they can be stored elsewhere. So uh, because of their nanometer dimensions in, in magnetic systems and the possibility of three-dimensional architectures, this could provide um, very good, very um, <clears throat> good storage for memory. Uh, but uh, before we proceed with discussing uh, the outer equilibrium behavior of such topological solitons in liquid crystals, I would like to give you a little bit of background because very likely you are very much familiar with other types of solitons, right? So uh, for example, um, the waves, you know, that are of solitonic type that you can see in here in the giant pool in the University of Maine, right? And uh, uh, yet another example of shallow water wave that is also topological in nature, you can see in here, uh, it's not the types of solitons um, that we'll be talking about today. The very simplest type of topological soliton is uh, depicted in this movie on the left. And you can appreciate that in a one dimensional space R1, uh, you can have um, a twisted structure of molecular alignment that is not trivial because uh, once you embed it in a uniform far field background where these molecules point vertically, you cannot eliminate it and it can move around, right? And so what we will discuss today is something of this type, but uh, in higher dimensions, right? And so uh, you can imagine taking such a twist wall and making an axisymmetric structure out of it as I'm showing here in this movie, right? And what this gives you through such a very simple construction is the simplest type of two-dimensional topological soliton, which we call baby skirmion, right? And you will see the reasons for that kind of name in just a little bit. 
And so uh, in these types of solitons can be found in liquid crystals and magnets as we discussed. In liquid crystals, of course, our other parameter space is uh, the um, S2 sphere, S2 mod Z2, right? So uh, because of the nonpolar nature of liquid crystal director. However, uh, there is a theorem saying that for two dimensional and higher dimensional spaces, um, the um, uh, solitonic structures can have their field vectorized smoothly in all cases, and therefore um, oftentimes we'll use a representation of vector field, right? And then the order parameter space is the S2 sphere. And uh, in the case of such two dimensional soliton that you see here, when you map such a structure with all different orientation to the order parameter space, you will cover it fully one time, right? And then the skirmian number in this case is equal to unity. Um, and so uh, when we published one of our articles on the skirmian motion of baby skirmians with this type of title, um, I was invited to pediatrics conferences actually after this, uh, but uh, it's not really baby that we are dealing with in here. Uh, it's a topological soliton. Uh, there is no even particle as I was mentioning, just particle like topologically protected field configuration. And so where does the baby name come from? Uh, well, it's all because of the uh, topological solitons that are found in high energy physics. And so in there, they were originally introduced by Tony Skirm to model the elementary particles in particle physics where the um, nucleons with different baryon numbers uh, would be modeled as uh, topological solitons that are described as elements of the third homotopy group, pi three S three. Right, and so in here, S3 actually corresponds to SU2 or the parameter space. Uh, and uh, these different integer numbers, Z, actually correspond to different baryon numbers, right? Or atomic numbers of the nuclei in periodic table. Well, uh, in uh, uh, condensed matter physics, as you already saw, we deal with lower dimensional number uh, analogs of such topological solitons, right? And because we are in lower dimensions, oftentimes uh, they would be referred to as baby skirmians for that reason. And they are characterized by the skirmian number that can be found, that can be calculated as this integral, but geometric interpretation is uh, the number of times that this field that you would map from two dimensional plane R2 to the uh, S2 sphere would cover that sphere, right? So in, in the case of example I was showing and you see in here, uh, this would be one. Uh, and then there are of course, uh, one dimensional topological solitons. So simply uh, an example of that would be the twist wall that you have seen. Right, and so they would be pi one S one mod Z two or pi one S one equals Z. Uh, but in addition, there are other types of topological solitons uh, such as Hopians, right? They would be actually uh, described by uh, the third homotopy group of S two or S two mod Z two. Uh, and uh, um, uh, in this case, uh, that type of mapping from S3 to S2 is the Hopf map. Uh, so again, we have integers in here and uh, um, uh, the topological invariant is the Hopf index. So if, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, the topological solitons attract interest in many different branches of physics from you know, nuclear physics, uh, high energy physics, all the way to cosmology and condensed matter and so on. 
And the beauty is that in liquid crystals, we can study them with optical microscopy. We, we can have them exhibit these beautiful types of topological dynamics that we will be looking at today. And one thing I want to um, convey in here is that in all of these cases, we are mapping from, uh, you know, in order to characterize such topological solitons with homotopy theory, we are mapping um, from the, uh, you know, one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, R1, R2, R3 spaces, right? But uh, uh, they can be actually compactified on the uh, n dimensional spheres, such as S1, S2, S3, in the case when uh, the structures are purely solitonic in nature. Uh, and uh, uh, as in these other cases, and also the far field background is uniform, right? And so, uh, um, and so this is when we can uh, do such compactification and classification of such topological solitons. Um, and so many of you, of course, familiar with uh, topological singular defects, right? Uh, and uh, uh, in that case, we can characterize them with the very same um, homotopy theory with the same um, elements of homotopy theory. So in the case of, for example, point defects, right? Uh, we would simply surround them by S2 sphere. And then if this is a unit vector field, then the order parameter space is a unit sphere. So the map from the physical space or configurational space as to, to the order parameter space is the second homotopy group, right? So just like that, our baby scorpion is also characterized by the second homotopy group, right? But in this case, we are mapping from two-dimensional plane that characterizes its translationally invariant structure, right? And the reason is because um, the far field in that, of that structure um, is uniform at, and you can do single point compactification uh, so that um, uh, it, uh, um, you know, then can be that R2, plane can be compactified on S2 sphere and you still have the same map. But moreover, you can see that um, in, in our studies, we often find structures where topological solitons coexist with singular defects. And actually uh, these topological solitons would be terminating on such point defects characterized by the, as the same elements of the same homotopy groups, right? So for example, when we have a pi two S2 topological baby skirmion soliton, right? Then it can be terminated on two block points or two uh, singular point defects of opposite charge. And uh, what this actually gives us is nothing else but a topological soliton, which we call um, a toron, right? So a toron is a skirmion which is terminated on two point defects where both the skirmion and the point defects are characterized as um, elements of the second homotopy group and Z in this case is equal one. And so what you also note in here um, is that um, um, the, um, uh, this um, process allows us to embed a topological soliton in a uniform far field background by terminating it on point defects that uh, have the same um, uh, topological charge represented by the same um, um, you know, element of the homotopic group. Um, so now uh, in liquid crystals, we realize them in nonpolar field, director field, and the material is formed by molecules like the one you can see in here that have rod-like shape. These are the materials that are very broadly used in displays. But one thing that is special in what we are doing is that 
we are adding chiral additives to such molecules that, you know, it's very similar to what you have in all kinds of displays, right, that you are using on a daily basis. And so these chiral molecules are very similar to the conventional liquid crystal pneumatic molecules, but they have chiral centers. And because of that, they have a tendency to twist. Now, the geometry of the experiments that I'll be discussing with you is also very similar to that of the display because we will have electrodes that are transparent in nature, will be applying electric field, which will be pulsed electric field, just like actually you do in displays because um, in there it's not DC, but alternating current, you know, that we are using uh, to apply and those also very low voltages on the order of one volt, right? Um, but uh, the difference is that um, we will have these topological structures realized in our system. And when we'll apply fields, we'll see them moving rather than staying in one location, right? And so if you'll take a cross section of such a uh, topological soliton, right? You know, and here, you know, this is a view from the top on our display like sample geometry, right? And now, if we change the boundary conditions, if we change the anchoring coefficient, um, we can go between the structures of the toron and skirmion that I was showing you. Remember, the skirmion uh, is translationally invariant. And toron is the same skirmion, but it terminates on the two point defects, you know, and then here, this would be close to the substrates confining glass plate of the display like liquid crystal cell. So this is our geometry, the uh, experimentally accessible anchoring coefficient parameters, you know, are listed in here. And the very similar ones we will also use in our numerical modeling. So actually this uh, video was generated by changing that surface anchoring coefficient in this range, which we can do in our experiment as well. And so now uh, for our modeling, we use uh, Francozine uh, free energy that you can see in here with all different elastic constants independent to measure it. Uh, we'll be applying electric field. So for this reason, we need to have the electric field, field coupling term, right? It's a dielectric system. So we, we have a quadratic term in here. And then there is also surface anchoring term, right? Which describes the uh, interactions of liquid crystal director field with the boundary conditions. And as I already mentioned, the coefficient W can be varied in a range from 10 to power minus four to 10 to power minus six joules per meter squared. And so now as we do this modeling and minimize free energy for different W coefficients, right? And for experimental elastic constants, we find that um, uh, these torons and skirmions can all be found uh, in different parts of diagram, right? For different values of W and the thickness of the sample. Uh, so the gap between the two glass plates in the geometry that I was showing. And so that means for our purposes of experiments to play with these solitons, all we need to do is to tune W, pH and thickness of the sample and we can have either skirmions or torons as stable configurations. And actually we can do uh, uh, three-dimensional confocal microscopy imaging to um, map these structures. And indeed consistently, consistently with numerical modeling, we can see skirmions and torons under these different conditions corresponding to this diagram. And so I should mention that very important part of the study is a three-dimensional mapping of such topological solitonic structures. Um, in order to be able to do so experimentally, we take advantage of nonlinear three-photon absorption-based um, um, 
emission flow, uh, excitation-based fluorescence from uh, the uh, liquid crystal molecules, such as pentyl cyanobiphenyl that you can see in here. So when we excite them with femtosecond laser, uh, we can get um, a luminescence that comes from three photon absorption process. And it's highly dependent on polarization of excitation light. We can take advantage of this very strong dependence to then uh, map three-dimensional patterns of the director field. And so here you can see a highly simplified schematic of such um, experimental setup that we use. But in addition, of course, in addition to this 3D nonlinear optical imaging, we use conventional polarizing optical microscopy to observe the structures based on the biofringence of the liquid crystal medium. And so we should start from um, you know, noting that uh, these solitons behave as particles and they exhibit um, a Brownian motion, right? They're jiggling around because of thermal fluctuations. Uh, and uh, uh, moreover, as we would apply electric field and we reconfigure these uh, topological solitons, so we morph them from axisymmetric structure that you can see here to highly symmetric one. With that, we also uh, alter their diffusion within the liquid crystal medium. And so you can see that these diffusion coefficients are voltage dependent because of that also the uh, viscous drag coefficients that they feel are voltage dependent, right? And uh, moreover, as we would um, apply voltage and turn it on and off, we find that something very interesting happens because uh, with turning voltage on and off, as you can see in here, this modulated voltage is being turned on and, on and off, the soliton is moving in um, the different spontaneously selected direction, directions, but the um, distance to which it moves is different in the two cases. Um, and so uh, uh, we can actually numerically model that uh, if we assume that um, we only have rotational dynamics and we neglect flows, right, of different types, like for example, backflows that we inevitably do have in this system. But even if only taking into account rotational dynamics and equating in here um, the uh, different torques, right? So this is the um, viscous torque in here, we can actually reproduce this dynamics to some extent, right? So you can see this is numerically modeled result and this ex experimental result, right? And you can see some uh, relatively good agreement, but the main thing is that we reproduce the asymmetry of that drift, which if you do this turning voltage on and off many, many times, you will find your topological soliton, like in this case, a skirmion, moving in a certain direction. And so that's very interesting because um, uh, all we are doing is we are applying electric field in a direction perpendicular to the motion direction that in the end we get. And so um, um, uh, how does it happen? Um, well, so uh, let's take a look at uh, what happens when we apply electric field. So you can see that as uh, you apply field, the structure of such uh, two-dimensional skirmion is morphing quite significantly, right? So first, it seems to be increasing in dimension a little bit. So this material actually has negative dielectric anisotropy, and this is explains why the, you know, this explains why you know the structure is increasing in dimension at very low voltages a little bit. But then the entire background is switched to in-plane orientation and this uh, topological soliton is embedded in a background which is now tilted, not vertical as you can see in here, right? And so um, um, 
uh, moreover, these structures, you know, becomes highly asymmetric, right? So in here so far, all we did is we switched voltage on and on. And with it, you already can see that this soliton kind of shifted to the right as you applied voltage, right? Um, but now um, uh, if we um, apply this voltage on and then turn it off, we note that the amount of drift in the two opposite directions is different, right? Moreover, uh, you will note that dynamics of drifting is also very different, right? So if, um, as um, um, <clears throat> you go from on state to off state and here, right? You can see that the soliton first moves very fast, but then, you know, stops, right? and uh, its position does not change anymore. Whereas uh, if you um, uh, go from off state to on state, right? Uh, in this direction where you change the symmetry when it becomes a symmetric, right? X direction in here, then you can see it moves not as fast as um, yeah, in the previous case, but it goes to a longer distance. And what this means is that uh, now you can change the um, frequency with which you're turning voltage on and off, and you can make your soliton walk in one direction or in the other direction, right? So, uh, you know, if, if you will be switching on and off, you know, at <clears throat> given, the, the periodicity of that switching being larger than 1.5 second in here or 1.5 second as an example, right? It, it will move in one direction, but for less than half second, for example, it will move in the opposite direction. And then here you can see the point at which these two curves cross each other, right? So this is where the motion direction would be reversing. And so in our geometry, we now can have these topological solitons in a, a glass cell, very similar to that of display. And all we are doing is we are applying electric field, which is modulated, which is in direction perpendicular to substrates, right? Because the field is applied to transparent electrodes of the cell, but the solitons move in a spontaneously selected direction perpendicular to the field direction, right? And this we will see can give to a lot of emergent effects um, that uh, will remind us active matter of different types. Um, and so uh, we know with quite a few examples in literature, right? Where uh, people have activated passive systems by supplying energy. And so this is one of the uh, one of the examples where there are vibrations of um, uh, or my mechanical agitation used to activate these uh, um, particles in here, right? And then they start moving and exhibiting two dynamatic like defects and so on, right? But uh, in our case, uh, our solitons, you know, would be perfectly static, you know, not moving anywhere. However, if we apply this oscillating field, we can um, steer this liquid crystal uh, director orientations, you know, in different parts of solitons, and that equally can uh, result in, um, you know, uh, emergent motion of such a topological soliton. Um, and so I should mention in here that uh, uh, this uh, uh, effect of applied external field far away from the soliton is the threshold effect, right? But in, in the interior of soliton, you respond to the applied electric field even below the threshold voltage or threshold electric field for the surrounding medium. And depending on that voltage that you apply, you will also have very different types of behavior in different regimes, right? And so um, 
uh, in here you can see what happens when we apply a low voltage modulated field, right? And then we observe between cross polarizers how the textures evolve of such a topological solitum. Moreover, in our numerical modeling, we can reproduce this behavior. And so the top one uh, are experimental images, but the bottom one are the computer simulated analogs of them. And what you note from this is that the um, evolution of the director field, which in here is uh, manifesting itself in these different polarizing microscopy textures, we know that it's uh, uh, not invariant upon reversal of time, right? So if you look at the times when you turn voltage on and off this modulated field, you can see that the texture evolves in a non-reciprocal um, way, right? And we reproduce it in numerical modeling as well. Um, moreover, as we would look at some more detailed features of such topological solitons, the baby skirmins that are moving in here, we would note that the shape of the twisted region, right, which we know here can characterize by this handedness parameter, right, which uh, is defined uh, as you see in here, very similar to what we have in the twist term of Frank free energy, right? And then uh, um, when we normalize it by the uh, uh, cholesterics wave number, two pi over pH, right? Q zero in here, then uh, uh, we see that this pink region that corresponds to high values of this uh, handedness parameter is evolving in a non-reciprocal way as well. And so um, um, in addition to polarizing microscopy images, this just shows how um, you know, this structure is moving because of non-reciprocal dynamics of director field orientations within the spatially localized topological soliton structure. Moreover, we can also look at the uh, regions um, we call pre-images corresponding to orientations of our, um, uh, you know, director uh, along the north and south poles of the vectorized S2 um, um, or the parameter space. And you again know that they evolve non-reciprocally. So in this case, we can conclude that this dynamics of the individual soliton arises from non-reciprocal response that we have in here. And we can understand it very easily in this context because we know that even in this place, the turning on and turning off response times of a display pixel are different from each other because there is different interplay of electric anchoring and viscose torques um, upon, um, and elastic torques upon turning voltage on and off. Obviously electric torque is not present when you turn a voltage off and purely elastic energy drives it back to um, the off state. And so in a similar way in here, um, we have different torque balances when we turn voltage on and off. So not surprisingly, evolution is very different, but because of also a symmetric structure, structure of the topological soliton as it evolves upon voltage modulation, we have this translational dynamics. And so in here you can see um, what happens at very low voltages that are below the threshold of realignment of liquid crystal fields, right, um, in the far field background. Just because liquid crystal only responds in the location of soliton, since we are yet below the threshold for realignment of the far field background, right, as we are modulating it, we can have such topological solitons moving around. 
Um, and um, um, in this case, I should mention, so of course, for the active meta behavior um, <coughs> characterization, um, it's um, um, uh, important to know what the Reynolds number, but of course, for other liquid crystal systems, it's important to mention that the Erickson number in here is, is low as well. So what it means is that in this regime, um, we can assume that viscose responses do not alter the um, you know, elastic uh, configuration of director field that much considerably, right? And so, however, you know, potentially the other regimes could be explored as well, uh, though not in this study. Um, and so uh, this type of motion, right, is uh, very interesting, I believe, because um, uh, you can see that the liquid crystal around kind of remains passive while only this topological soliton is activated. It's similar to what you have in racetrack memories in magnetic systems, right? Where you have a solid film, you cannot have any motion, it's not a fluid, of the atoms of this solid crystal in there, but the spin texture can move because you can continuously rotate the spins and with that you can translate such a um, skirmion in this case along the racetrack memory, record information, read information and so on. It's also similar to another very familiar phenomenon which is uh, the stadium wave, right? These people are not going anywhere. They are just waving their hands and you can see that wave simply moving on the stadium. In a similar way, these liquid crystal molecules do not really have to translate with such a topological soliton, although they are free to move because this is a fluid, but uh, uh, they can just rotate and with that, rotational dynamics, uh, we can have the topological soliton moving around. And so we can, we have confirmed that in the regime of low voltages, uh, uh, we can have such a soliton moving back and forth and the tracer particles, which would provide evidence for flows, do not show them following such a topological soliton uh, so it can simply pass through, as you can see, this, this uh, black trajectory is uh, the skirmian trajectory, while the particles undergo Brownian motion and jiggle around with a little bit of black backflow effects taking place, you know, at, at some locations across the depths of the thickness, but being not really um, instrumental for uh, such um, motion of solitons, right? Um, and so uh, um, they are present but weak. And so as I already mentioned, by changing the frequency of modulation, we can have such individual soliton moving in opposite directions, right? The direction is spontaneously selected, but once it's selected, we can change frequency and we can have it moving back and forth. Uh, and so that, that um, motion can be also controlled by changing voltage. So now it's interesting to go from just one topological soliton to many of them. And so uh, we can take laser tweezers and, and we can, um, you know, have help them find each other. And you can see in here a single guy, a couple, a trio, uh, and you can see like little chains in here, and then you can have many, many of them, right? And they start exhibiting collective behaviors that are not predictable very easily, right? Because you can see all we are doing is changing frequency and, and apply it modulated voltage, um, but they can choose the motion directions, they can join together or split apart into different groups, right? And here in a different regime, they can form chains that are 
meandering around, you know, and um, exhibit those uh, highly emergent outer equilibrium behaviors that oftentimes you would associate with living matter, but we don't even have particles here. All this is, is the structures in the field. Then oftentimes you can see also some defects forming and then moving around, you know, in the field lines around the singular defects. Um, so a lot of interesting emergent behavior, as you can see, can occur. Um, and moreover, importantly, there is no repetition, as I mentioned, Already, this is very emergent behavior. Uh, um, you can have them moving around for days and they will always find a way to um, do something new and different um, each time. Um, and so to get insights into what really happens, how they interact when they move, we probed uh, uh, both pair interactions and many body interactions. And so with laser tweezers, we can just bring them into towards each other and see what they do. In this case, you can see they repel as depicted in here for these two computer simulated topological solitons. This movie is an experiment. You can see that when they are uh, asymmetric in applied field, they attract more or less like uh, you know, the electrostatic dipoles would, you know, head to tail interactions in this case. And so what you do going from this movie at the top to movie in the middle is you just simply change voltage. And, you know, in here you can have more quantitative characterization of interaction potentials, right? As you're changing voltage, you're morphing these particles, you're reconfiguring them, and changing the interactions from the dipolar attractive to uh, repulsive, right? And, and there is a lot in between when they attract uh, weakly or if they are side by side like this, they repel even at applied field, right? So because those interactions are highly anisotropic and you can see in here that if you um, bring them with laser tweezers from different um, orientations, right, relative to the tilt directionality of the background tilt in this geometry, then they will indeed behave more or less like electrostatic dipoles would. And so uh, now uh, this was when you don't modulate a field, right? So you just have uh, AC field applied all the time. But when you do modulate, they don't just simply attract or repel, they um, start moving together. But as they move, they also change their mind how they want to interact with each other. So you can see in here that the two solitons um, uh, in the beginning were closer to each other, right? But then as time went on, uh, and they were moving on this trajectory, uh, they um, got to be at a larger distance. And so this movie is showing, you know, a trio of them moving and originally they started a shorter distance, but they spread apart a little bit as they move. And so what should we expect as we get to more and more of these topological solitons? So in here you can see an example where we have tens of millions of them. So this is um, uh, a sample, much like liquid crystal display. The solitons are a few microns in dimensions. And then uh, um, you can see as we generate them and oscillate field, they form a little school in here that is depicted as gray area, right? And as you zoom in, you can see that there is some structure within this school. If you zoom in even more, you can see many of them like these guys in here moving, right? In a certain direction. And you start noting, oh, they seem to know where they are going. They seem to be going in the same direction. You also note that um, uh, these uh, little clusters are highly reconfigurable, they always change and when they move, 
and they're also interacting with all kinds of obstacles that they find on the way. Uh, they, they find a way to go around those obstacles. So uh, we characterized uh, all different parameters uh, and how they affect the collective behavior in such a system. And we find this incredibly rich because uh, uh, as we change voltage, frequency of modulation and uh, um, packing fractions, so how many of them we have within the sample, we find that there are regions when they are simply unstable, right? That's because those are not in these parameter spaces uh, equilibrium of energy in some way. So even if you don't apply field or you apply and you don't modulate, they wouldn't be stable. Then there are regions where they are behaving as individuals and regions where they behave as um, uh, social beings, I would call, they tend to form some little clusters of different kinds. And then those clusters can form schools, right? And so um, um, we can reproduce this clustering in our numerical modeling. So in, in some applied voltages, they prefer to be these more isotropic clusters. Uh, at higher applied voltages, they tend to be more linear chains, right? And we can understand this because we can um, qualitatively model them as uh, uh, dipoles that um, um, tilting uh, uh, to different degree relative to the plane within which they interact. And so when they are in the plane, they are forming chain, uh, end to end chains, right? When they are tilted somewhere at intermediate tilt orientations, they form these isotropic clusters. So now um, there is a lot within the diagram, right? That uh, I summarized, but we can now take a, a peek, you know, at uh, how exactly they behave. So you can see that there is a regime where they effectively preserve social distance, you know, if you wish. Although this is not six feet apart, this is maybe, you know, six micron apart, um, but uh, they are not clustering in any way. They are staying apart and they move in the same direction. So this is a big school of skirmions. However, they are all individuals within that school. The school has social distancing in place. Uh, and uh, we can see that um, as we characterize um, uh, the mean versus uh, RMS, root, root mean square, we can see that uh, the slope in here is larger than 0.5, which you would have for passive systems. And uh, um, you know, uh, so uh, you, you have um, um, uh, this behavior um, uh, that you know, people often refer to as giant number fluctuations. Um, and so uh, uh, now as we um, would look at their motion directions and characterize the velocity or the parameter, and also we can define vectors, you know, if we point an arrow from uh, the south to north pre-image, right? So this is a vector that, um, defines the polar orientation. So we can have a polar order parameter and velocity order parameter. And uh, we can see that soon after we turn voltage on and start modulating, they, with time, originally they have all different orientations, but with time the orientation synchronize. And with that, these order parameters both increase uh, very quickly within seconds, pretty much, right? They go to values very close to unity, right? So these are the polar and um, uh, velocity order parameters, right? So after some seconds, they already move all in the same directions and have their pre-image vectors pointing in the same direction. Um, so um, now, uh, as I already mentioned, 
we, we, we probed many body interactions between such topological solitons. And we can see that there is a minimum in here, which means that we have adhesion of some kind. So they don't want to stay apart. They want to move collectively within the school because even though they are at large distances, there is some attractive interaction between them while they move within the school. Um, and so in here, you can see a different regime. So all we did is slight change of voltage and frequency. And you can see that um, now all of a sudden they form little clusters, right? Of different nature, either isotropic or linear, depending on voltages, right? And, uh, you, you know, kind of interpreting everything with our pandemic time terminology, you could think about these clusters like families, right? So you are now allowing closer distances between family members, but families still socially distance from other families as they move. And again, as we characterize the um, mean versus root mean square, the slope is uh, quite high, much larger than 0.5. So we do have analog of giant number fluctuations. Another thing to note, uh, so, this is this huge school moving in the big cell that I was showing you. And we only see small part of it because, you know, if I zoom out, you will not see individual guys, but you can see the edge of the school. So this is the end front, uh, you know, um, and uh, you can see that, um, um, that, you know, no guys are lost. You see this little guy in here was, kind of stuck somewhere on some imperfection, but then it was catching up with the rest of the school, um, right? So they have well-defined edges, right? You see this little guy is catching up, right? And the reason he is able to catch up because as an individual, he can move a little bit faster than these clusters. Um, so uh, this is all very interesting because uh, you could say, well, what's a big deal? They are clustering. Those are little baby skirmians uh, form some families. Um, but uh, uh, actually this connects very nicely to the very nature of skirmians in high energy physics where clustering of individual skirmians gives you high baryon numbers, which then explains the subatomic particles, uh, you know, with different high baryon numbers, right? Um, and uh, up to now in condensed matter, we only dealt with the baryon numbers uh, or skirmians with elementary skirmian numbers, right? Because they did not want to form um, skirmians with high degrees. And, you know, we published recently this Nature Physics article where we actually managed to form so-called skirmian bags to be able to have high pi two s two equals z high z value, right? Skirmian numbers, um, and and so. But what you have in here, these are emergent uh, high degree skirmians, much like these nuclei in high energy physics that you would have, right? Like in here, right? So. These are all formed by clustering of elementary high energy skirmians, right? And these are their liquid crystal analogs that um, are not stable in equilibrium, but once you start oscillating field and they go out to equilibrium and they start moving and you get those clusters for free, right? Which is exciting. Um, and so, um, all right, we have these different regimes I was discussing, and I just want to emphasize that in this diagram of states, right, we can have all different types of behaviors. Uh, and this is just a peek at one regime where the entire school with tens of millions of skirmians is moving, and uh, we are looking at some small number of them in here. Um, and so, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, the edges of skirmish are very well defined. Uh, and uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, in all different regimes. And I already showed this little guy catching up with the rest of school because individual skirmishes can move faster than um, the clusters of them. So now um, we went with different ways of controlling their behavior. In this liquid crystal sample, we can use tweezers to produce all kinds of obstacles. And so in here you can see, we can have all kinds of jamming and we can have all kinds of rectifications of the clusters that so they pass through some arrays of obstacles, right? And uh, you can also see that uh, as we apply electric field, you know, we can unjam them, right? So in here they are moving and there are some obstacles. <clears throat> and uh, at some field, oscillated field, uh, you know, they're just simply jammed. But as we increase field a little bit, we could unjam them. Um, and so that's very interesting because uh, normally, say if your active particles would be cows and they try to go through some gate, well, uh, it would not be so easy to unjam them, right? And here you applied voltage and they went through. Um, good, so uh, um, uh, yeah, some advantages of using topological solitons as active matter, matter particles, you can see. All right, now we will go to a regime when it's very dense, right? You know, this is really not pandemic times anymore. You know, no social distancing. They are very tightly packed. They are forming those crystallized with grain boundaries in between them. Um, and in here you can see this experimental grain boundary is being characterized you know, they show different orientations of crystallographic axis. And if you oscillate field, interestingly, these crystallites are moving too. And they too select the direction of motion. Moreover, in here, um, this example I am providing actually for torons, where you have not only just skirmion, but skirmions terminating on point defects. Right, so every single guy that you see in here is a skirmion with two point defects close to the opposite surfaces of the cell. And so when my students showed me videos, you know, when these guys moved, I, you know, I, I had hard time imagining how to understand or interpret it because I saw that the only crystal that can move uh, and preserve order is North Korean army that you can see in here marching, right? So there is crystal order and there is motion, but these guys apparently can do this too. And you can see how they do it. Um, they preserve the arrangements, you know, everywhere uh, in here where it's yellow, there are six neighbors. Uh, when we have five or seven neighbors, we have this, um, different ways of coloring them. And this is where we see the five, seven disclinations or uh, grain boundaries, right? And um, you can see that soon after you start oscillating field, they all figure out in which direction they want to collectively move and they move there. And that's a spontaneously chosen direction. So next time, Next day you come, you apply field and they might move in the different direction. Um, and so reminding you that these are the skirmions, right? That are terminating on point D if it's close to the confining surfaces and they're all second homotopy group elements, right? Uh, skirmion terminating on point defects. Again, we can characterize their velocity order parameters uh, and uh, how they move in these arrays. And there is a lot of very interesting behavior that we can actually again reproduce well, in our modeling. So you can see good agreement between experiments and modeling for some uh, you know, selected region of the sample in here, right? And, and so these are different visualizations 
um, as we apply field in here, right? So this is now within a tightly packed array. What we note is that um, the, um, uh, as you apply field because the wall, the material has negative dielectric anisotropy, uh, these guys start to expand in their lateral dimensions, but also as you oscillate field, uh, these point defects go out of the plane in here, right? So they are kind of being sheared in a way. So it's not only, um, you know, the, the size kind of increases, but they also um, being sheared in a way by applying oscillating field. And so in order to get some insight into what's really going on, it was very difficult and painful to pay attention to all the different arrows. And so what we did is we visualized uh, the point defects, right, that on which those guys terminate, and then also pre-images of north and south poles uh, of these uh, uh, topological solitons within the arrays, right? And so now we have these different presentations in here with the vector field, right, color it. And then those are experimental polarizing optical microscopy images between parallel polarizers. And then in here, you can see this visualization. So pre-images and point defects, right? So this is in lateral plane and this is in a vertical cross section. And then as you apply field, you can see that indeed there is some form of effective shearing of that structure that's taking place. Uh, and so uh, again, here's a little bit different way of visualizing for one single hexagon, right? So at no applied field, you can see that the point defects are right, right at the top of each other. And you have one of the pre-images of North Pole connecting them, as you can see. But as you then apply field and you oscillate it, you have them moving in this direction. You have some effective shearing in this direction. And this is all very dynamic when you apply field, right? So here is a video. Uh, and this video shows you what happens in the plane collocated with point defects, right? These are these little bright spots. You can see them jiggling around, but if you pay attention, they're also moving in the same direction, right? Uh, and so as the video is playing, you can see the, uh, the defects are moving, these little hexagons in the background are moving, which are tightly packed, squeezed, squashed uh, topological solitons. And, uh, um, you can characterize this motion over a long time. So in here, the positions are time uh, color coded, right? And you can see that they are just shifting the hexagonal primitive cells very nicely as they move with time. And uh, as you would zoom in even further, you start noticing a lot of this uh, jiggly motion, right? That you have, um, at each point in time. And uh, um, as you zoom in even further, you know that uh, uh, this is pretty elaborate motion, right? Where the centers of um, these um, topological soliton particles are executing pretty elaborate motions while they move. Um, so now, uh, let's see what happens under different basic conditions. When we have no applied field and we look at average displacement, there is no average displacement. They don't go anywhere. Uh, they are um, you know, undergoing Brownian motion, yeah, but um, you know, there is nothing happening. They, you know, there is no net motion. As you apply it field, that oscillating field, they exhibit linear uh, uh, time dependence, right, of this uh, average displacement. If you look at mean square displacement, um, then you know that even in here, in this region, the mean square displacement is linearly dependent uh, on time, right, at no applied field. That's because of they are jiggling around. 
right? But as you apply field, then you have that kind of quadratic dependence, right? And as they are moving for the mean square displacement, right? And as you turn off field again, you go back to this regime, right? So um, this is what really happens. And now you can characterize um, the, you know, the individual defects and topological solitons, and you can see how they are undergoing different displacements um, uh, with motion. So I'll not go into too many details of that. Um, but then it's interesting to ask a question, what happens with these crystallites as they move, right? So how do they evolve with motion? So you can see here the, the region and sample at different times, zero second, 250 second, 500 seconds. Well, we can now uh, do our analysis of where the defects in hexagonal lattice are, right? At these different times when they are moving, right? And you can see that um, in some way, you, you can notice some annealing of defects of these grain boundaries but a few of them, you know, this time. So there is some annealing of defects. So actually you could say you got a better crystal with motion, right? Uh, and indeed, as you would characterize um, the, uh, so, so this ordering is quasi hexatic, right? Uh, uh, hexagonal, right? Because uh, the, um, you know, they're a little bit sheared yet in the cross sections, you have something very close to hexagonal lattice. And so as you would now uh, characterize um, the local bond order, right? And uh, if you would, uh, you know, characterize it and plot it in the, with these different colors, and then you can characterize hexatic order. So you can see that um, um, with time, that hexatic order, say, within these regions of the sample did increase, right, with time. So indeed, you got more ordered uh, system as time passes in here with motion. And then we also can characterize the velocities of these particles, right? So now we can look at these regions and see in which directions they move. And so you can see in here these arrows pointing in different directions. So we, we characterize um, how they synchronize their velocity. So originally um, these uh, crystallites, you know, start shearing and the, the, they start moving in all different directions, not very orderly, but then very quickly synchronize so that the shearing direction and motion directions are orthogonal roughly to each other. Um, the velocity order parameter is on the order of 0.75. It's lower, you notice, than what we had for the Skirmian schools with social distancing, because in here, when they are so tightly packed, there are defects and they are kind of obstacles for each other in their motion within this very tightly packed crowd. Um, <clears throat> Um, and they are also squeezed in the motion direction. So that's another thing that is interesting to note. Um, so uh, uh, again, uh, you could ask, well, we, we saw how motion evolved for individual skirmians, for little clusters of them. How does it happen for these crystallites in here? Uh, and so you see this in a movie for, the case when we observe uh, such a crystallite between two parallel polarizers, you can see very interesting evolution of texture um, as they move. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to know that that evolution is non-invariant in time because we can uh, characterize rotations of these solitons within the crystallite and also their translations and you can see that effectively as they move, they rotate to the left and to the right, not just move straight, right? And uh, this uh, amounts by which they rotate in different directions are different. And this is highly non-reciprocal motion within each period of voltage modulation. So here's where 
voltage is turned on and off, right? So effectively, each individual guy is rotating to the left and to the right, and then uh, is um, translating at the same time by some distance. Um, and so, uh, well, uh, this is a rendering of that kind of motion where the different colored regions show pre-images of constant directed orientation and the little um, uh, spheres at the top and bottom of these structures are to, uh, topological defects, the hedgehogs, right? Uh, point defects, right? And so it's pretty amazing for us that uh, this motion is so elaborate because um, all we do is oscillate the field. And actually it's not really student pushing the button on and off. It's all automatic, you know, by function generator. Uh, and uh, uh, the field is, you know, in direction or orthogonal to the plane of the sample. So all of this is spontaneous. All of this is emergent. Um, and in some way it reminds, you know, some of the better times when pandemic was not here and carnivals could be going on, right? So I'm hearing from discussions uh, with Mikola and Margarita that uh, there are a lot of experts from Brazil in carnivals in your group. And, uh, you know, they probably know all about this. Uh, well, this is a topological version of carnival because these are the defects, the pre-images of order parameter space that exhibit this very interesting dynamics. And so far, I only discussed with you the baby skirmians, right? And torrents, right? Which are based on them. So the elements of the second homotopy group, but there is a lot more that liquid crystals of different types can offer. And our research group discovered hopians and, and um, helinotons of different types. You can see in this, Article so those um, um, those are the um, you know elements of the third homotopy group of S two or S two Z two, right? Recently we are also working on other types of solitons when we have different uh, types of um, uh, order parameter space, right? So all different kinds of biaxial or thorombic monoclinic liquid crystals. And so this means that um, in fact, there are many different topological particles that we can play with. And it will be very interesting to explore, you know, how the topology and this outer equilibrium behavior are interlinked with each other. What types of dances they do in carnivals, if you wish. Uh, and this is all um, in future. And hopefully some of that will be also explored within this collaboration with Mikola, Margarida and other colleagues in the department. And uh, well, this brings me to the summary. So I hope I was um, able to show you that topological solitons in passive liquid crystals can be activated in very simple ways. They're highly reconfigurable particles, which um, mimic um, soft active particles in, uh, in biological systems. They are squashy in nature, if you wish. Um, they exhibit very nice emergent uh, behavior and we could see it for both skirmins and point defects um, <clears throat> within the torrent structures. We could see moving crystallites and lattices and this all is in highly accessible materials, in materials similar to those we use in displays. What it means is that we can now think about this outer equilibrium collective emergent phenomena being not just simply a matter of fundamental science, but how could we use them also for interesting applications? Um, and uh, um, perhaps, you know, uh, we could find ways of emergent control of light and new breeds of electro-optic devices. Um, and um, also I should point out that because of the interest in topological solitons in so many 
branches of science, what we do here in liquid crystals has implications for those other fields. And that also is very important. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ivan, for nice. Now we have, can have time for one or two questions if there is an audience. So are there questions? Oh, I, I, I just okay. want to start. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to raise a hand and I can't. Yes, yes go ahead, Mabida. <laughs> I, I'm not too good with this, uh, with this, uh, all this technology, even though the pandemic has given me time to adapt. But thank you, Ivan. It was wonderful. I mean, I did not know anything about this last part. These, uh, but even, I think you really have to come. Now we have money to pay you. We just hope the pandemic ends and you need to come for some time. Uh, as much as you can spare to try and tell us something about uh, the details that of course we missed but if i have time do i have time to ask one quick question yes one? yes go ahead okay. so of course some of these directed motion will be tied up to the fact that uh, the on and off uh, times that you allow the field to act are different but some of it also probably depends on these relaxation times to adjust to the field when it's on and off uh, can you can you tell me if if, if that matters and, and how much of one and how much of the other is playing? Yeah, the you're role? Co completely right. Yes, absolutely. So uh, you know, in the liquid crystal pixel, right, that just on and off time would be ten milliseconds or so, right? In here, there are different time scales involved because first of all, you should you know we should understand that. Um, uh, it's not any more translational invariant configuration. So there is not only one time involved, right? Uh, as you would have in the case of a pixel, there would be just something determined by the gap thickness, right? And elastic constant, viscous coefficient, and so on. And here you also have lateral dimension of the skirmion. Mm -hmm. And so there is, uh, you know, that response now that is characterizing how it's being squeezed and uh, morphs, you know, on which time scales. And those are much larger actually. And, uh, you know, while we characterize them and when we see them in, in numerics in some way, there might be also some opportunity of understanding them analytically somehow by, you know, applying some nice modeling to that as well. And then, uh, um, you know, you're right that there is also time scale of interaction between those guys, right? Because they are at some distance to each other. And, um, uh, you know, if, uh, if we are changing this frequency, right? Um, in some frequencies, they have time, for example, if they are with dipoles in the plane, they want to get closer to each other, right? Um, but, you know, by the time can, they can make uh, a step forward, you know, towards each other, I would say, right, to form a um, chain like cluster or something like this, um, you know, maybe we changed voltage because we oscillated in, uh, in it all the time. And then, uh, well, they want to do something different at that other voltage, they want to go farther apart, you know. And then if they are getting these conflicting messages, get closer, go apart, you know, get mm. closer, go apart. And uh, they figure out something, you know, that, um, you know, is a compromise, right? And, and, you know, then you have this emergent behavior, which is highly reconfigurable because conditions always change. And uh, they're getting conflicting messages and this is, you know, from oscillating voltage, right? But uh, the important thing is that this is, um, uh, you know, allowing us to have a lot of knobs in um, altering this outer equilibrium behavior. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I don't want to uh, monopolize. I have many other questions, but I'm sure we'll have time to, uh, to, to talk again about this, but thank you very much. I'm not expert on a Brazilian carnival, but we have some Brazilians local, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they, they can uh, tell you all they, they know about the Brazilian carnival, even if you come to Lisbon, this is now. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> an added, an added uh, attraction. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. It was very, very, very good. I mean, it My was pleasure. so packed that, uh, I mean, I had uh, 
a zillion questions, most of them stupid, but uh, I'll save them for when I when we can talk. If the pandemic mm -hmm. does not decrease, uh, we'll talk through these means sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully okay. it goes away. Yeah. It will go away, but I mean, we might have to get on with the work before it goes away. So. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the time and yeah. thank you for the talk. My pleasure. I have another question from Nuno. Nuno, please. Hi. Hi, Ivan. Thank you very much for your talk. My question is related to the, to the size of these objects. So how do you define their size? And in particular, you, you have talked about uh, diffusive properties. How, they how this size compares with the hydrodynamic radius? and with the interaction radius that you, that you can also fine tune? Yeah, very good question. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we can define the effective size um, by um, uh, essential. So, you know, you, they are in a uniform background, right? Uh, and so, you know, whenever, uh, so you, you can see in here, whenever it's black, right? Um, that's uh, when the arrows point uh, orthogonal to the screen. Um, and so we can just simply, you know, choose some value of the polar angle, right, away from that vertical orientation, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that will define the effective size, right? So it can be one degree or two or five. Uh, that's not sort of too important, but uh, qualitatively, that's what it is. And then when it comes uh, to, uh, um, uh, you know, when it comes to the diffusion, so let me come to here. Um, it, so now that size, that effective size we can control because we are controlling pitch and the sample thickness, right? And so of course, the larger is the size, the slower is the diffusion, right? So let me see where I have that uh, demonstration. And um, then as we are applying voltage, uh, you know, of course the diffusion correlates with that uh, effective size, right? I think I'm almost there. Yeah, so here. So uh, um, you see what I mean? So as we would apply, you, you see, the size and you know symmetry, everything is changing a little bit, and so with that also diffusion coefficients change. Um, so you know in here we have two two different directions, and uh, the structure becomes asymmetric right along one of the directions, and this is where we see quite significant change of the diffusion. Right of these objects, but would the, the the hydrodynamic radius be comparable with the sizes that you measure with this particular definition, or? Yeah, yeah. So in in general, it would be, but we should keep in mind that um, this is a very peculiar object, right? Because um, um, you don't have any particle, right? Mm -hmm. Its entirety is just the structure of the field. So now you could ask a question, what is actually resisting its motion, right? And what is because, viscosity, right? Right, exactly. And so we have in liquid crystals rotational viscosity, right? Because, uh, you know, that um, uh, viscosity coefficients characterizes uh, the resistance of the medium to rotate director, right? And mm -hmm. so for this soliton to displace, in any of the directions, you need to rotate the director, right? And there is that resistance to director rotations. And so what we do very qualitatively is we, you know, can hypothesize that there is effective uh, size, right? And then we can take viscous coefficient. And then we see that actually with that approximation, if we assume this is a particle and rotational viscosity coefficient, you know, we take, you know, then we actually can recover from a simple model, you know, like if it were to be a cylindrical object moving into D, you know, we can recover, you know, this type of uh, drag coefficients. 
roughly, order of magnitude, of course, but, but here they are measured. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Nuno, thank you, Ivan. So I think at this time we should stop our seminar. I would like to thank again to Ivan for his nice talk and hope to see you soon in real time or in virtual. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Yes, and you also have to come to Lisbon to the conference. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, yes. whatever. It will not be <laughs> yes. this year or even 20, I don't know, it will be a few years, I think. <laughs> In a year and something. I'm totally lost with time. This is what the pandemic did for me. My yeah. time scale has evaporated. But we'll be seeing you at the conference, before the conference, through the screen.